Let's explore the ocean floor in Fallout 4. Bethesda put a great deal of work into making the seafloor outside Boston littered with relics that showed the true devastation of the nuclear apocalypse in 2077. Most of this detail goes completely unnoticed by those of us who play the game on the land. That is, after all, where all of the quests are, where all of the stories are. But what stories can we learn from exploring the sunken ships, the skeletons covered in algae, and the locked containers untouched for millennia? We will explore the ground underneath every submerged surface connected to the ocean in this game. To do this, I changed my Fallout 4 settings to make the water clear so that we can see every detail. When you explore this in your game, however, you may want to leave the water alone to get the full impact of this submerged, gloomy world. I'll also explore some places that may give you some spoilers, end game spoilers, like the devastation of a certain headquarters, for example. And if that bothers you, you might not want to watch. But mostly, we'll explore things that most people never get to see in their playthrough. Now, there are countless sunken ships, busted out houses, and cars littering the seabed. I'm not going to show you every single one. I'm just going to show you the ones that I found interesting, the ones that I thought told a story, or the ones that had interesting loot. However, I encourage you, if you have time, to do this on your own so that you can see every detail. This took me two and a half hours to explore absolutely everything, and I'm going to condense it down to the best parts. It took me four in-game days, sleeping at night when possible, so that I could show you the details only during the light of day. We start at the very top of the world by the Nanako residence. You only find this place if you have Far Harbor installed. I brought Kate with me. She and I are gonna hop out of our suits of power armor so that we don't immediately sink to the bottom of the floor. I have the Aqua Boy perk, which means I can breathe underwater, but if you don't, you may need to bring the deep diving suit that you get in Far Harbor so that you don't have to come up for air. Lastly, because I have the underwater effect turned off, you're gonna see some graphical glitches, particularly with the ocean surface, so I beg you to just ignore those. You typically won't see those in your game. Traveling south from the Nanako residence, we see an underwater pipe. There's a hole in the side of it, but it's blocked up in refuse and mud, but it connects to a splitter in the middle. From here, the pipe goes off in many directions. Following the pipe west leads us to the Makra fishpacking plant. I'm thinking this may be a sewer that the Makra fishpacking plant connected to to get rid of all of their fish waste. Turning back around and following the pipe east, it goes on and on round a corner. Nearby, we find a steamer trunk next to a bathtub. This is one of the places you go to when you find the messages in a bottle. I did an entire video on those messages, which I encourage you to watch. You can check out that video here. Continuing east, we see a sunken tugboat. This is one of the innumerable tugboats that we find on the bottom of the seabed. Inside this one, we just find a first aid kit, and at the very top, we find a stim pack. Back down and continuing east, the pipe snakes through some rock. But then we come to the edge of the world. The pipe ends here as well, but the border of the world prevents us from peeking inside of it. It's interesting though that this pipe opens up into open water. Looks like the refuse from the Makra fishpacking plant just went out to sea. Heading south, we find another big pipe. This one comes out of a brick wall built underground. Following it west, we find a little shack built around some rocks. Here we find a couple of duffel bags filled with loot and a ladder that brings us up on top. This is due east of the Kingsport Lighthouse. Going back to the pipe and following it east, we find an overturned ship. Inside is a big red steamer trunk filled with loot. I don't remember this from the bottles, I could be wrong. We also find a skeleton and a first aid kit. Just off the coast of the Child of Adam crater, we find another sunken ship. Inside are a bunch of nuclear waste barrels. But what's interesting about this is I apparently found two invisible enemies. One invisible Child of Adam Reborn, and one invisible Protectron Basilisk. Now, I, I suppose it could be that this is due to some mod, but honestly, I can't think of any mod I have installed that would put this here. Things just don't magically appear in the world because you happen to have a mod installed, so I can't explain this. I tried shooting at these invisible enemies, but none of them took damage. I couldn't talk with them or interact with them, but they were all over the place. I found another little shack on some rocks attached to this sunken boat. Inside, the previous owner was trying to grow crops, 
we find his skeleton lying on top of a pallet on top of the shack. And everywhere we look, we've got this Protectron Basilisk. I'd be curious to see if you guys find this in your game too. Is this just an effect of some mod I have installed, or is this in the actual game? Note that I do have all DLCs installed, and it might come from one of them. Sitting on some plywood, floating right next to this rock is a wheelchair with a woman in it. At least she was in it. In my game, she slipped underneath. Right next to this scene is a rowboat with a couple of corpses inside, a woman lying over the edge, and a man submerged with his leg propped out. East of this point is another floating series of shacks and pallets. I'm not sure if this is just after the war, or if hundreds of years after the bombs dropped, people went out to sea to try and find refuge, but we find a lot of these little floating shacks all over the place. This one has some tar berries nearby. We find a dead woman lying over a barrel, a first aid kit filled with chems, and more tar berries. In true water world fashion, these guys were trying to grow crops and tires, buckets, and all sorts of stuff. We find yet another skeleton lying in a sun chair in a rowboat. Back underwater, we see that this little floating outpost is attached to some sort of pre-war machinery. There was a big exhaust pipe sticking out of the water, and it led down to this base. And there's a light sticking out of it, a working light. This will light up at night. I'm not sure what this could be. East of this point, we find a sunken cargo freighter with lots of big orange cargo containers on the deck. The hull is completely rusted out. You can swim on down there. We see many more of these big orange containers. We can swim on up the steps to the room beneath, and from here, climb up to the rooms above. I didn't find any loot up here, but it is an interesting sight. Next to this is another big pipe. Following it south, we see that it goes right to the town of Salem. This must have been the sewage pipe for the entire town. Traveling south, we see another pipe, but this is a smaller, rusted-looking pipe, but on the sides are working lights. This leads directly to the Nahant Oceanological Society. The lights travel along this pipe, still lit up today, 200 years after the bombs dropped, connected by a wire. It goes back underground, but we can see it peek out and dive deep into the water. Following the pipe, we go deeper and deeper until we find a split. One part goes west and the other part goes south. Let's follow it south first. Following it south, we pass by two sunken ships. Near the ships are a bunch of toxic waste barrels. This may hint at what the contents of those big orange crates were on the freighter. On the ground, we find one solitary bar of steel. Continuing south, the pipe splits again. One part goes east, but it's broken. This leads to an invisible wall, the edge of the world. So we'll turn back around and follow the pipe west. As we continue, the pipe meets another larger pipe. The smaller pipe goes into the ground, and we don't see it again. So instead, we'll follow the larger pipe. This one snakes underground through the mud, through some rocks, until we come to a strange underwater facility of some sort. We find big reservoirs still lit up, connected to each other with big snaking pipes. Some of them have little grates sticking up. We can't access these. There's no way to enter it. It's not a doorway to any interior cell that I know of. Now, this is one of the more fascinating finds we find underwater, to me, because this connects directly to the Nahant Oceanological Society. If you remember my video on the Nahant Oceanological Society, which you can watch here, we learn that the society was doing a bunch of experimentation. They were taking a look at the effects of company waste disposal and other activities going on in the water. They were even staging protests and trying to do other forms of civil disobedience obedience to express their outrage at what was going on in their environment. This structure under here may either indicate some secondary facility that the society used to do their experimentation, an underwater base that they might have used to possibly secure arms, preparing for some sort of environmental rebellion, or it may have simply been a means by which they conducted really complicated experiments on the layers of soil deeper in the ocean. The only surface structure we find these pipes connected to is the society, so this has to be connected with the society in some way. Could this be the remnants of some cut content Bethesda was planning? Or did they just make this elaborate series of pipes underwater for us to discover on our own for fun? The pipe moves on from this facility west, but then it goes underground and we lose track of it. So instead, let's go back to that fork in the small pipe, and instead of turning south, this time we're gonna go west. The pipe dives deeper into the water and then breaks off 
into a number of smaller pieces. It was likely broken by this big green tugboat as it sank to the seafloor, but then it continues on into the mud and we lose it. By now, we've come to the Libertalia area. We see Libertalia above us. In this playthrough, I haven't actually cleared Libertalia yet. Eerily, I found some floating raider corpses sunken in the water. In addition to the floating ships and barges that make up Libertalia, we find a bunch of other ships on the bottom of the sea. Big containers, crates, but most interestingly is a big brick pillar sticking out of the ground. This supports one of the platforms that makes up Libertalia, but I wonder what it possibly could have been pre-war. No one after the war built this, and it's just a big rectangular brick block that goes deep down into the seafloor. I wonder what it could have been. At last we find the small rusted pipe that went west into the earth. It comes out the other side, near Libertalia, and snakes over some more sewage pipes. But then it dives back down into the ocean floor. East from this point, we find a tugboat tipped over onto its side. It hasn't actually submerged yet. Scavengers had turned this into some sort of home or shack. We find rowboats and floating platforms, and the skeleton of a man next to a globe. We find a cord or cable of some kind, still connected to the tugboat going deep down to the ocean floor. When we get to the very bottom, we see a barge. This must have been what the tugboat was tugging. On the barge are house pieces. We find the roof of a sanctuary-styled home and lots of other scrap. Maybe these sanctuary-styled homes were part of a big house kit. And this tugboat and barge were bringing some of these pieces to, I don't know, the West Everett Estates, which we know was under construction. Next to this is another tugboat. Inside one of the bottom floors, we see a fully intact giddy-up buttercup and a wheelchair and some other stuff. However, no matter how I tried, I couldn't get through the door. Even though the door doesn't appear to be blocked, I just couldn't swim through. So I actually had to toggle the free cam to go and explore this. We find a skeleton lying on the ground next to the Giddy Up Buttercup and a vault tech lunchbox. By now, we're on the bottom of the sea, south of Libertalia and just north of Fort Strong. Continuing southeast, we find more shack roofs on top of barges and more big iron pipes stuck in the floor. Following one segment of the pipe east, we come to the edge of the world again. Just outside, there's a, a dock of some sort. Uh, this is strange to me because I'm not sure what a dock would be doing built on the seafloor. Are we supposed to think that the sea level was much lower back then? Or maybe this is part of a dock that washed away? We can't actually reach it, so instead let's go back and we can follow the pipe west towards the land. Like the other pipes, these have lights attached to it, and it climbs up the hillside west towards Fort Strong. We know that a lot of important research for the military happened at Fort Strong. This must be a sewer pipe or a water pipe for that facility. There's a lot to explore around Fort Strong. We even find a bus shredded to pieces with a lunch pail inside. Floating above it is a half-sunken fishing vessel. There's a suitcase floating nearby, and even a chair with a Jangles the Moon Monkey sitting in it. Near to this are two fishing ships stacked on top of each other on top of a rocky outcropping. This was a shelter of some sort. We find a rowboat next to it and a tent made from a tarp. Here we find the skeleton of a woman with a pack of cigarettes. Looks like she was enjoying a smoke before she died. Sitting on the lounge chair on top, we find a teddy bear next to a tea set. Nothing makes me happier than a teddy bear having a nice cup of tea. Continuing south, we find a barge split into three sections, two of which have sunk. The one that still floats has another home on top of it. We find a Nuka-Cola machine, the skeleton of a woman next to some scrap, a big metal box, a cigarette machine, even an ice cooler with a skull on top of it. We even find a working porta diner. But again, my luck is not good enough. I didn't get the perfectly preserved pie. Diving down beneath this floating barge, we find another sunken tugboat. Nothing of interest here except inside we do find a plaque. However, we can't interact with it. We don't know what it says. It's interesting that Bethesda would purposefully choose to place a plaque in this ship underwater, but with nothing on it. Swimming south of this point, we find another barge, this one fully sunken. It had a bunch of those containers on it, which have all spilled out onto the seafloor. Directly above us is a series of wrecked boats still floating, connected by seaweed. Here we find our first aid kit and a number of skeletons. In one of the boats, we find an unlocked safe. Swimming back down, we find an interesting scene. A sunken ship straddling a deep crevasse. Right next to this ship is a sunken fishing boat. Inside, we find a duffel bag with loot and a skeleton. Diving down to explore this sunken scene, we can swim into one of the rooms where we see something bizarre. Three cat pictures still stuck to the ceiling with the word meow scrawled in chalk. 
How could this be? The ship is upside down. That means that these were glued or taped to the floor before the ship sank. But for what reason? I don't know. There's nothing else here. No cats, no cat bowls, no loot. Swimming further south, we are now just north of Spectacle Island. Here we find another partially sunken barge, which has been turned into someone's home. On the barge is a shack with a bed, a wooden crate with some explosives and random loot, and taking the steps up, we find the skeleton of its previous owner. Here I slept until morning so that we can continue to explore in the daytime. Now from here we can either go south to explore the water around Spectacle Island, or we can swim towards the bay. Let's swim towards the bay and explore that first. Along our way we find another fishing vessel with what looks like a generator on it. Inside is a human skull and spine. The nearby tugboat has a skeleton squashed underneath some sort of machinery. And one of the most odd things we find is a bunch of rowboats attached to some kind of pylons sticking up from the ocean floor. These have been joined together to create some sort of shelter. We find a big metal box, a lot of tar berries, and some sleeping bags inside. On one of the pallets are some children's toys, a car and a block, and some candles that are still lit. But the really interesting thing about this is that these ships are tied to some sort of brick structure that seems to be growing right from the ocean floor. What was this? It's almost like some sort of obelisk, but with a flat top. What could this have been pre-war? As we get closer to the city center, we find more pipes coming up from the seabed and going towards the city. Following them towards Boston, we come upon the Yangtze. It's quite a striking submarine. With water effects turned off, we can really appreciate the shape of this vessel. The pipes lead to the Gwinnett Brewery and Restaurant, which we explored in another video. But following the northern pipe past the submarine, we come upon the wreck of a Horizon Airlines flight. This is a nearly intact airplane, which is a rarity. We can explore one of the wings. This is where the passengers would have sat, but strangely we don't see any seats. Going inside, we can swim up the steps to the cockpit, but there's no flight recorder, data log, or a black box or anything like that. Continuing to follow the pipe north leads us to the opening of the Charles River. We found a sewer grate, but sadly it didn't go anywhere. Ah, that's a missed opportunity. I would have loved to explore it. And as we enter the Charles, we find even more wrecked airplanes which of course makes sense because this is right next to the Boston airport. Swimming into the Charles River, we get a big burst of lag. That's because we're heading towards Boston and moving pretty fast in this water, so you're gonna have to forgive me if things are a bit choppy from here on out. As we passed by one of the checkpoints, I saw that Deathclaws were attacking my poor Brotherhood of Steel soldiers. I went to help, but then forgot that I wasn't in my power armor. I'm so used to being in my power armor with this character. I realize now just how squishy and vulnerable this guy is outside his tin can. After defeating the Death Claws, we can jump back into the water. The Charles snakes off into a number of directions. We're gonna go up the northern passage first. Up the northern passage, we see that it too splits east and west. We're gonna go up the eastern passage first, but there's not much here. It leads us to the Revere Satellite Array. Right on the water is a floating shack of some sort with a red locked door. Unlocking it, we find a ghoul eating a corpse. Ah, oh, that's a nasty sight. And going the rest of the way, we find another shack on the water with a power armor frame inside. Well, we've exhausted this leg. Well, let's go back and instead of going west, we'll head east. Heading east towards the bridges, we find a floating platform. As we get close, we get doused in radiation. That's because the barrels keeping this platform afloat are filled with nuclear waste. Heading under the bridge, we continue west and we see lots of wrecked ships just outside the Irish Pride shipyard. Passing through yet another bridge, we find a bunch of pipes in the seafloor. These lead to the Poseidon Energy Turbine number 18F. I believe Poseidon Energy used this as a nuclear power plant. Maybe this unscrupulous company was pumping toxic waste into the seafloor. Just outside the pipes on the riverbed here, we see a fully intact skeleton. Continuing to the end brings us to the Taffington Boathouse. The river ends at a sewer up here, which I explored in my video on the Sutton family. So we're going to turn around and retrace our steps. Back to the first split in the Charles River, we're going to follow it west. 
Along the way, I got a notification to defend a nearby checkpoint. Gunners had attacked the Brotherhood of Steel here. And even outside my power armor, I decided to dare it. Continuing west along the Charles, we come to a dam. This dam leads to the lake right next to Covenant and Mystic Pines. At the bottom of the lake, we find a couple of skeletons. Of course, we find some pipes with a door that leads to the compound. I covered the interior on these pipes in my video about Covenant. And at the very end of this lake, we find a crashed vertebird. Next to the vertebird is a suit of power armor. I don't need these T-45 pieces, so I'm just gonna snatch the fusion core. Back to the first split in the Charles, we follow the major arm in the river west. And it's here where we find one of the numerous Jaws references in the game. On the seabed is a cage. Inside is a skeleton with a knife next to a box. There's a cable leading up to the ship above. And on top, we find a dolphin shark gnawing on the skeleton of a man wearing a blue bandana. Back in the water and continuing west, we find a floating platform platform under a bridge with a wooden crate on top with some random loot and nearby another floating platform this with a glowing one on it this person must have been trapped on the floating platform and turned into a ghoul over time because the barrels supporting it are filled with toxic waste around about this time it was starting to get dark I wanted to find a place to sit and wait so that I could finish exploring during the day. However, when I hopped on out, I came face to face with a behemoth. Oh my gosh, I'm squishy outside my power armor. As I continued along, I found another behemoth. This time I was able to get rid of him from range with my missile launcher. It took me forever to find a place to sit, killed a couple of Mirelurks and a Mirelurk King, and finally found a bench next to a burning vertebrate. When morning came, I hopped back in the water and continued west along the river. We passed by a number of floating ships and platforms. One of them had an unlocked safe inside with randomized loot. And at length, I came to the ruins of the Institute. If you destroy the Institute in your game, the place where the Institute once was gets flooded by the Charles. Strangely enough, <laughs> and I don't know why, I saw four synths floating in the water above the Institute. I managed to hop up onto the land and take care of them with my missile launcher. The radiation coming from the nuclear blast that destroyed the Institute is absolutely wrecking me. It's a good thing I came with some refreshing beverages. They really saved my skin. Continuing along the Charles, we find another Jaws reference with a cage underwater, a skeleton with a knife, and on board, a skeleton with a blue bandana and a machete defending himself from a dolphin shark. As we continue, we find a partially sunken red ship filled with nuclear barrels inside the skeleton of a sea captain with his sea captain hat lying nearby and an ammo crate underneath the desk. By now, we're just outside the Beantown Brewery. Going under the bridge, we see a series of pipes that lead to the Beantown Brewery, but we can't interact with them. And underneath the second bridge, we find a ruined orange train car, but it's filled with rubble. At length, we come to the locks. Inside the locks, we find the skeleton of a man with a pro-snap camera at the very bottom, and that's about it. On the other side of the locks, we can find a red rocket truck stop sign on the seabed, and a lot of refuse. There's a bus down here, a half-sunken ship with a skeleton crouched in a corner next to a bottle of beer, and the river bends south, and it's getting much more shallow. At length, we pass the Egret Tours Marina on our left until we finally arrive at Cutler Bend. Cutler Bend is interesting. There are two or three boats still floating, but underneath them all are half a dozen wrecked boats. But sadly, no loot, no containers. Although, the Murloc Kings found me, so I had to hightail it out of there as quickly as I could. By now, the Charles River is turning into swamp. It's hard to swim. We can only wade here and there. And at length we come to the edge of the world. That's the end of the Charles River, so all we gotta do now is go back to the area around Spectacle Island. That's where we broke off and went west towards the Charles, but now we can explore the area outside Spectacle Island. As we travel south between Spectacle Island and the mainland, we see a bunch of pipes. These are heading towards some sort of structure built on top of a rocky ledge underwater. Part of it is collapsed. The catwalk leads back up and we can use it to swim up on top. Inside we see some cabinets and that's about it. This must be part of a waste management system because the pipes leading out of it lead directly to the Warwick Homestead. We can follow the pipes all the way there. 
These pipes are actually open. We can swim through one of them, and inside we find a red toolbox, but that's about it. They lead us all the way to the Warwick Homestead and stop, but we missed a bay by the castle, so let's retrace our steps and follow the pipe west around the Warwick Homestead. It dives deep into the ocean floor. Here we find another sunken barge with shipping containers on it. We're now close to the Adam Katz garage. On the water near Adam Katz is a barge with a Mr. Gutsy. I managed to take out the Mr. Gutsy, but Kate decided to throw some grenades. Here, I made this for you. She just wouldn't stop throwing these blasted grenades. I found a yellow shipping container with a skeleton inside. Kate was still all fired up. Remind me to take those grenades out of her inventory. Inside the crate was a wooden box filled with grenades and ammunition. Heading back southeast, we can circle Spectacle Island to see what's on the western side of the island. At the base of the island, we find a big broken house. Inside, we see an interesting scene, a skeleton in a wheelchair watching television while listening to the radio. He was probably drinking in the apocalypse. There's a big bottle of vodka next to his wheels. South of here, we find another one of those strange brick obelisks sticking out of the rock. On top of this is built a really nice shack. The radio is still playing when we approach. We can loot a big metal box, some dirty water. There are sleeping bags all over the place. Inside the big yellow shipping container was the farm. They were trying to grow wild mute fruit here. East of this point is another floating barge. This must have been a junk barge. There's a bunch of pallets and refuse sitting on top of it. Inside the control box, we find the skeleton of a woman surrounded by candles. The ship was tugging a big barge and scavengers have built a home here. It's really nice. There were walls and roofs, a couple of beds. Here we find an advanced locked safe. The skeleton of the previous owner is lying on the ground. But most disturbingly, as we continue exploring, we find a coffin, the skeleton of a woman inside. And back outside, we find even more coffins. One is a boy with a basketball, and then two more floating right next to the ship. These poor people must have sailed out to sea to survive the nuclear blast. They built a home for themselves on this barge, but then one by one they started to die from radiation. The survivors put the bodies in caskets until even they too died. Connected to this barge by a cable is a sunken tugboat. Inside we find a bunch of boxes, even a big couch. Directly beneath it is a broken pipe. Strangely enough, with a rowboat inside. I can see how the pipe would have broken. The tugboat landed right on top of it, cracking it open. But I can't explain how the rowboat got in the pipe. Heading north of here, on the other side of Spectacle Island, we find another wrecked Horizon Airline flight. This one is much harder to explore. We see a globe by the steps, but we can't go up into the cockpit. The only other thing we find here is a trash can. Doing the full loop around Spectacle Island, we find a tugboat still aloft. Inside is a human skull next to a microphone. And in the room below is a wooden crate. Next to this are two police boats with their spotlights pointed at the ship. At first I thought maybe these police boats were here to help, but at the very top we find two skeletons. I get the idea that maybe these two were fleeing. Or maybe there was some sort of military curfew and the city of Boston was cracking down on people fleeing the city. Or maybe these were thieves who in the chaos after the bombs dropped stole something and then tried to make it out to sea but then the police cut up and shot them here on top of their ship where their skeletons lie today. In the water directly beneath this scene is another big container ship. A lot of these boxes you can explore, but we don't really find anything interesting aside from barrels and nuclear waste. Heading northeast from here, we see a tanker off in the distance, but as we try to get close, we bump into the edge of the world, which is a bummer. I really wanted to explore it. We also see some more shipping containers on the ground next to the freighter. So we've explored everything except for what's south of Spectacle Island. Swimming south of this point, we find another series of connected tubes. These are really interesting. One snakes around this big bulbous dome sticking out of the mud. I'm thinking that this may be part of the waste management system that was part of the Warwick homestead. None of them have any hatches or openings, so we can't explore inside. Right next to these pipes is a sunken ship, and inside we find two skeletons. 
next to a coffee maker. I've always really admired the shape and design of this espresso machine. Nearby, we find another tugboat with a lunch pail and some milk jugs. It still has the containers it was hauling. And southeast of here, we find a barge that was carrying a bunch of Corvaga cars, which of course makes sense because the Corvega assembly plant is right here in Boston. The plant must have just finished these cars and then put them on the ship for worldwide distribution when the bombs dropped. Sadly, none of these cars ever had a chance to drive on roads. Traveling south from here brings us to the edge of the world. We can't go any further south. So instead, we'll go east to explore this water before we come up on top of the marshes. In one crevasse, we see three wrecked ships covered in shipping containers, but no loot or skeletons inside. Going southwest from here, we see a completely sunken tugboat with nothing but the control pod visible. Hanging out of it is a uniformed skeleton. Typically, these are commercial vessels, so I wonder what a military service person was doing inside one of these ships. Maybe after the bombs dropped, he was sick of the military, he just wanted to survive, so he hijacked one of these ships and headed out to sea before bad winds, probably fueled by the nuclear fallout, caused his ship to sink. Heading through a big opening in the rock, we find even more pipes buried underwater. In one of the pipes, we find a big red hatch, and inside we find a skeleton next to a big steamer trunk and a first aid kit. This is another one of those locations we go to from reading the messages in a bottle. And at last, the edge of the world pushes us out of the water onto the marshy beach next to an abandoned lighthouse. From here, we can go back to the Nakano residence to get back into our power armor. And with that, we've explored every submerged inch of the Commonwealth, aside from landlocked lakes. I am astounded at the detail that Bethesda put into this underwater world, a place where most people will never go. The detail just adds to the realism of this post-apocalyptic wasteland and tells us a story of Boston residents trying to flee with their meager possessions and survive out on the water away from raiders and the US military. I glossed over this pretty quickly. There's a whole lot to explore. If you're interested, I encourage you to explore it for yourselves. It's really a fun trip. As impressed as I am by Bethesda putting this much detail and effort into it, I have to say I'm a little disappointed that there weren't more secrets to be found. I would have loved to have found some hatches that led to interior cells to explore. And I wonder if there are any modders out there who might flesh out Bethesda's story here and create for us players some interesting places to explore underwater. That's the beauty of Bethesda games. We have a huge thriving community of modders that can make the world even more interesting. Thanks for watching everybody. I publish a new video six days a week, so if you don't want to miss tomorrow's video, be sure to subscribe and to hit that bell notification button. I've got a t-shirt shop, ladies and gents. If you're interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below. And if you'd like to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.